Welcome, everybody, to the next episode of Blender Nest. Um, unfortunately, Grant and uh, Curtis can't be here, so we don't have our great English accents for us today. But hopefully, we're bearable. I got tired of us <laughs> fat <you>. Americans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but we're here, and today's topic is freelance. Uh, before we get into that, uh, we are on Patreon if you guys want to support the channel. And uh, we just relaunched. We just recorded our first bonus episode yesterday. Yeah, so we we're gonna be doing bonus episodes every single month. And of course, we have the Discord and we have early access. So let's get into uh, today's topic, which is freelancing. We I have a ton of questions here that we'll just go into. We'll just get into our background of freelancing. We'll start with um, Southern Shoddy. What's your What have you done in freelance? What's the kind of things you do now? Yeah, so I started freelancing when I was in college, so about eight years ago, and I started freelancing after an internship. I had an internship that went well at an agency in Atlanta, Georgia, and I left before we were able to complete the project. So they uh, just started kind of freelancing at college, and then they tossed me a tiny bit of kind of like their overlap work every once in a while. They did a lot of print design, so they didn't have animation in-house, and then I started inter freelancing for my boss at my next job because they had another company that they were working at and they would kind of bring in some work there. And then from there on, I had a couple friends that I graduated film school with that had gone on to work at agencies and they would kind of pull me in occasionally. And then in the last year or two, it's really kind of taken off. I've gotten to work with some bigger clients, I've gotten to work with Facebook and Spotify and Audi were kind of like three big clients I got to work with recently and it was all great experiences i've personally found the bigger the client the better the experience they seem to understand kind of like the digital world a bit better or they have people in charge that are more understanding of that world so that's been exciting to kind of work with clients like that and then now i do uh a lot of uh this kind of stuff like educational like content and courses and resources and things like that and honestly, since I've begun doing this stuff, I work at my studio a day job and then I come home and I work doing this stuff usually a couple hours every night and then every weekend. So that's kind of been taking over my freelance life, <laughs> to be honest, right now. So you most so you have freelance clients, freelance clients, I thought I botched that word there. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do all that at night, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how does, how does that work with getting sort of sending, do you generally finish what pretty much the client asked for, send it to them that night, and then do whatever they asked for in the next night? Yeah, so if you're going, they call it moonlighting. So when you freelance after your day job, and if you're gonna moonlight, you just have to be upfront with the client, you know, in the beginning that you're like, I have a nine to five job, and you know, um, I'm not gonna be able to hop on call like every day during those hours if that's going to be an issue and i also can't really charge a day rate so i go by an hourly rate or a flat rate but yeah i'm just upfront with the clients about the fact that i have a moonlighting my freelance and that i'm you know i have a nine to five job i won't be able to talk during those hours all the time you know i can walk away in my lunch break every once in a while and the other issue is that i can't really charge a full day rate because i can't put in eight to ten hours a day on this freelance. So usually I work on an hourly rate or a flat rate. And if I'm gonna do a flat rate, I'll kind of discuss with them upfront the scope of the project. And I don't ever usually give them like a single number. It's usually, it's better to give them like a range. So you don't say like $10,000 or $5,000, you know, you'd say five to 10,000 is what I estimate, you know, estimate, like if it goes to this many hours, you know, it'll be 5,000 and so on. So I'm just like clear in my communication with the clients and then uh, I communicate mostly over email and then I occasionally will step away on a lunch break for a phone call here or there. Does that does that often scare away clients when you tell them I have a full day job and I will be um, um, moonlighting? Yeah, so it did. It does scare away some clients and the clients it's going to scare away are going to be like studios because studios are all operating on a nine to five job. They have a full team and they want to be able to collaborate with you during those hours. In my experience, if you're doing direct to client work and they don't have an internal creative team, they generally don't care because they're kind of operating over email most of the time. Anyways, you know, they're not really waiting for assets to hand off in their personal team. And then uh, a couple of the agencies and things I work at, I have friends there. So they're more than willing to communicate with me after hours and grab assets after hours. But generally, I'll just send out emails or things in the morning so that they're not like waiting on content from me. 
and it's usually not an issue. Cool. So, um, Blender Binge, what's your experience? What have you done in your freelance? Very similar to, to Southern Shoddy um, in, in charging. Uh, the day rate just doesn't work with having a nine to five and pretty much my entire freelance career has been, you know, I, I've held a nine to five at the same time. It's kind of tough because uh, you are working, you know, all day long. And, and most of my career has been doing 3D animation and stuff in, in a, you know, nine to five type environment. And so you go home and you're freelancing as well. Uh, there, there was a time that my brother and I owned a company and we would, uh, we would do jobs. We did, you know, I think I, I mentioned the MRI machine that we did for Hitachi. Um, and we, we done uh, some spec work for Disney. Um, and then, you know, the, the projects kind of fell through it there. I was hoping that would actually go through, but that was doing a video game for them. And then there was one for Samsung. Uh, but it was it was all just based on hourly rate. And and now if I'm doing the, the freelance stuff at the, I, you know, I would I would bill out, you know, I, I kind of set a cost plus model. So I'll agree to a certain a certain price that will do. And then if there's any changes or anything comes, you know, after that, they agree that that's going to be extra. And then I would charge them the hourly rate after that. And usually, you know, you can, you negotiate up front in good faith and they're usually really chill and really cool about that. So, uh, that's kind of been my experience. Cool. <clears throat> um, I wanted to ask because we all, we all have these pretty substantial channels with a big following since that has happened. Have you guys in CJ matter, you can get onto this as well. You don't have to, you don't have to done freelance to answer this. Um, do you, have y'all gotten any like interesting people reaching out to you asking you to help out with some stuff? Like, what have you? Has that happened? Yeah, everybody thinks I'm a <clears throat> like a motion capture expert that I know how to take just like footage they give me and then extract <laughs> like the face data from it. And I always reply, I don't know what you're talking about. And then and then just going back quickly. And in, in terms of freelancing, I've done a tiny tiny bit. I'm like a flea in the world of freelancing. I'm a flea lancer. Um, I had a friend <laughs> who. Uh, had this like gaming channel he's like i need some intro with dubstep like that that thing from you know a couple years ago made that did a couple other small things but the only like big freelance thing i've done which is actually a bit strange this guy i know has a company he has a thing i'm not gonna say what that is but what he wanted me for is to actually make tutorials for it so it has nothing to do with 3d he didn't need any renders he didn't need anything he needed somebody to explain and that was a pretty like strange uh request i thought would you would you do it or is that something you didn't really feel like doing so that that's something i'm about to do and it's going to be like a series of like let's say 30 pretty short they're not going to be blitz tutorials they're just going to be normal tutorials like how <laughs> cast style just super simple but i'm going to be doing a bunch of those and um as for as for the people contacting yeah there, there's been a lot of motion capture requests and a lot of people um asking to like join their team to like make short films and stuff i don't know if you guys have gone those yeah i think i kind of scare away like the those guys because i do for the most part loops concert visuals and things so most of my clients still are concert visuals but every once in a while i'll get like a game someone wanted to make a game one guy wanted to start at a wanted he wanted to start a, a ad agency with me which was interesting mm. Mm. um but for the most part, I've been very lucky to keep getting the clients that I want. Um, so that, because I guess the, my visual style caters to the the, the DJs. And um, that cat. Oh, <laughs> he that was cat. starting to sniff the mic and bat at it. <laughs> yeah, I swear cats know what they're doing. They oh, know yeah. what you, oh, he does for sure. On your keyboard. Yeah, he'll like, <laughs> he, he's a needy cat. So he'll just hop on the keyboard and be like, hey, love me instead. So my last cat, yeah. Sam, when the garage door would close, he knew that if you walked under it, the sensor would, um, he would hit the sensor and it would go back up. So we would have to like hold him to close a garage. <laughs> Cats are very smart animals. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, but yeah, no, I, sorry. I was just going to say, in terms of freelance, since I've started the YouTube channel, um, I haven't gotten very many like serious freelance requests from my channel. You know, a lot of the people I get are more kind of like hobbyist or like small teams like wanting to work together, but I don't get like big clients reaching out to me uh, per se. Not that those other people aren't serious, but I'm talking about like, you know, higher paying work <laughs> that'll, that'll pay the bills and things. A lot of the people that reach out, they just want to like collaborate on something together for free, which would be great if I had unlimited time. I'd love to work on all those projects, but um <clears throat> I do, and as we all had, I'll get like sponsorships and that kind of helps me put more time into the channel because, uh, 
it'd be great to do everything completely for free, but you know, <laughs> you have to pay bills yeah. and things. And so there's a lot of interesting sponsors out there. I try and choose ones that are related to the channel, not like just completely relan- random ones. Like I got, I think I got one for like, like a random like gaming service that had like nothing to do with the channel. Like, I mean, I, I, th- I, I would think that people that are in Blender are tech people and they're likely to play games and things. So I can like see doing a game ad, but some, oh no, what it was was a credit card one. It was like a credit card company wanted me to run an ad. And I was kind of like, why? <laughs> I was like, why? I'm like, I teach yeah. Blender 3D, but you know, like Core Weave, you know, like a render farm service, or I just got one for a 3D photo scanning app. So all of those kind of apps reaching out. But really what uh, growing a following has helped me do is build my own brand and that I'm producing a lot more content so that when I reach out to clients, trying to get work or when I reach out to people I know and I'm saying like, oh, I'd like to get some extra work here. It's like I have a lot more to show them and to give and to offer. And, you know, it's kind of like I've kind of built out my brand more. And that's really where my freelance benefits is that like when I reach out to these other things, I kind of have that like brand that I'm building behind me, which kind of legitimizes I think my reach out. I've just noticed that after I hit a certain number, a lot more people started responding to me. You know, because yeah. I, I I haven't I've, I've actually messaged less people now because I'm so busy doing the YouTube channel and I enjoy it. And between the community being so supportive on Patreon and the sponsorships, it's kind of like negated the need for freelance on the side to pay the bills. But so like I'm actually reaching out to less people, but like I get more responses. So I'd, I'd have to think that's because of the following and kind of the brand like building. And also I think that like when you're challenging yourself to build that brand, you're also just producing more content. Like I don't think any of us would be producing as many loops or character animations or visual effects, you know, if we weren't doing it to do tutorials for the audience that watches them. How do you guys go about pricing yourself? How do you pick like, which is like a big thing. How do you, place value on your own work especially if you're someone who really loves you like i love my work um and i would charge way more than i than people would pay because i'm very you know I, I think what i do is awesome so how do you go about pricing yourself to other people so i think a lot of people probably have an issue with this the first time they price themselves since the first time i've priced myself i think my current price is maybe like 10 times higher than what it used to be and the way you price yourself is you keep nudging it up until people start refusing right what you Mm -hmm. should be paid is what people are willing to pay and sometimes that is a lot more than you think you're worth in many cases sometimes they'll be like oh we're gonna give you this you're like sure sure that's what it's worth Uh, i'll take that I've, at least I've had stuff like that happen. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah, you go on Upwork or you go on Fiverr, and you just see people pricing themselves so far below, and you know they're not making a back end on it. And you're like, how? <laughs> you need to be pricing yourself what you're worth. Like, don't, don't think that your stuff is not worth it. Like, it is. If, it's, if you're good enough, people will pay you, and you need to find the people who will pay you. There are a lot of people out there just trying. I see so many ads like, you know, oh, just, you know, do this. It's a feather in your cap. It's it's work, you know, it, it'll be a high-profile gig. Like, no, they'll just burn through you and the next guy and the next person, the next person, the next person, and then they'll just constantly get free work out of the community. Like, no, price yourself what you're worth. I have and, a and story. That's, that's a mathematical formula. Yeah. yeah. Um. I have a story. Well, for, before I tell the story, for me, I I really have no idea what I'm worth. For me, the what I do, I, I think when it comes to, I think you, it's hard to place value on something that's that's like art. I think you just ask as high as you can. Ask what you think the client will pay. If they say no, you'll go down. But I think it's not like how much am I worth. It's how much are they going to pay me, and do I think is the time that I'm going to put into that worth that. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's all about like, I want to charge as high as I can, but I don't want to overcharge because I'll just get a bunch of no's. So it's really yeah. trying to find that middle ground of the type of clientele. But it's funny when, when you're like a really small artist, people like to use the promotion word, mm-hmm. you know, work for us, we'll, we'll promote you. I, when I was, I wasn't even doing 3D at this time. I was doing a lot of After Effects um, animations, text animations, things like that. And so, um, this guy comments on one of my Instagram posts and he says, Hey, he goes, Hey, check your DMS. So I checked it and he says, Hey, can I use this? Can I use these, um, things for album art? And he, I said, um, no, I don't do any work for free. So this was when I was like 
barely touching into freelance. So I was like, no, I don't give my stuff away. We can talk about a price though. He's like, he's like, oh no, I can, I can promote you. So before I responded to that, I went to his account. He had 7,000 followers, which I think he bought some of those because he mm-hmm. gets like 35 likes a photo. And so I just ran his stats back to him. I was like, you have 7,000 followers. You get 30 likes a photo. Um, of those people, would I get any clients from that? Likely not. Um, so I wouldn't get any value from your promotion. And then I guess he saw that, you know, he hit the wall. So he's like, all right, man, well, I'll take it anyway, unless you can prove that you have copyright on it, I can just use it. And so <laughs> I went to the co- the copyright website, whatever that's called, and I copied and pasted the the law basically is, you know, essentially as soon as pen is to paper, you own copyright on that. Mm-hmm. That's your work. Oh, yeah. You, it's illegal to take it and use it for your own profit. So I gave it to him and then he goes, I, I sent him, I gave him the law and he goes, no man, unless you show me signed evidence, I can take it. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I blocked him and then he came at, to, at, at me with another account. I was like, hey man, you can't block me. I got another account. So I blocked that account and then I never heard from him again. So you don't know <laughs> if he actually ended up using it or not? Well, I, I checked the SoundCloud for like two weeks and it never happened. And then I forgot about it. You scared him. <laughs> you did it. So it was a bit, it was the weirdest experience I had even to this day. Yeah. So I think uh, when you're talking about pricing too, like you got to talk about the different types of pricing. So I think the Blender audience has a lot of um, hobbyists in it. Like it's really popular for hobbyists. I've done like polls on my channel and stuff because I was curious. And I think that just because the the barrier entry is so low that there's a lot of people that are just using it for fun, like as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And then there's some people that want to make money off of their hobby. And then there's some people that are using it to make money. And um, some of those people are young and maybe like getting into freelance and they may not even know all the different types of payments that you have for freelance. So I think it's kind of important to cover some of those different types of payments. And, you know, you have generally like the three main types of payment you're going to have is you're going to have like an hourly rate and you're going to have a day rate and you're Mm -hmm. going to have a flat rate. And, you know, those can be different depending on what kind of work you do. So I know that some logo designers, they design a logo and they're like a logo package is 1500 or a logo package is 5,000. And like, that's their rate. That's what they sell a logo for. I think more commonly people are going to do hourly rates or day rates. But before I move on to those, I think the important thing to touch on with flat base rate is this is something I'm still learning. And I think freelancers are always learning, but like the most appropriate way to kind of do your flat base rate is with something called value based pricing. And what value based pricing is, is uh, determining how much value the product you're giving them has and basing the price off of that. So for example, if you're doing a, let's go back to the logo design example. If you're doing a logo design for a local coffee shop starting up, they might not have $5,000 for a logo. They might only have 1500, mm-hmm. but let's say you, you land a logo treatment for Nike. They're, they're going to have 15 to $30,000 to spend on a logo. So you can like base the value, uh, you, you know, base your price on the value of the product. That's something for like, when you're much further down the line, that's actually something I don't even do that often because uh since i moonlight and things it's like i'm not getting deep enough into clients and i'm not out in la so you know when i'm working with bigger clients and not generally doing that big of projects that's something that businesses usually do more that's something mm-hmm. that studios usually do more you don't see individuals doing it as much if you can work up to the point that you can do that that's the best place to be in business wise as a freelancer and then you have your day rates and your hourly rates and how you calculate those is up to you and what your goals are with freelancing. But if you're freelancing full-time or if you're freelancing part-time, what you need to do is you need to generate your base cost of living. So what you need to do is you need to take at least, and I'm not going to give you full financial advice, go talk to your bank if you need that. But like (laughs) an, an easy way that I do it is it's like, I'll look at three months of living expenses and I'll go through everything. I'll go through all my bills, all my groceries and any accidents that occurred, unless if it's like a freak accident, like during those three months and I'll kind of calculate out like, okay, if I took out the movie tickets and the video games and the snack runs and the eating Hmm. out, how much money do I need? Right. And then you kind of have to have a padding on that. So, 
then what I'll do is I'll kind of divide that out. And then it's like, well, how many days do you need to work to make that money? Right. So like it's unrealistic to think that if you need two thousand dollars a month to live and you charge a day rate of two hundred dollars, it's not very likely that you're going to get 20 days of work every month if that's what you're doing mm -hmm. full time. So you need to account for that, too. Like what's realistic? How many days of work are you going to get if you need? 2000 a month to kind of like survive, then it's like, you might need a day rate of something like 500 because you might not mm -hmm. get more than four days of work a month, depending on that. And also you're going to go through seasons. So like, there's going to be like, usually around the holidays, there's an uptick in the beginning of the years, there's an uptick, but there's usually a dead zone, you know, about once or twice a year that you're not likely to get freelance work. So let's say that you're going to get eight days of work this month, but you might not get four days of work for the next two months. So you need to account for that too. And uh, savings too, because freak ac accidents do occur. Uh, that's kind of how like you go about calculating your day rate. And you can base that off of the area you live in, but that kind of devalues it for everybody else. Because if you live in a very low income area, why wouldn't you want the same rate as somebody working, you know, in LA or New York? So go for it if you can. If you're working with local clients, you're probably not going to get that. If you're working with national clients, you can probably get that. Hourly rate, pretty similar to your day rate, and you're going to have to be more flexible. You're also going to have to start doing stipulations, like what does a day rate mean and how many hours are you willing to work in a day? So like, when does your overtime start? Because if they're asking you to get a project done, on an incredibly tight deadline, you need to value your time. Cause I've had to work overnight before and it's like, okay, well that's, you know, so you should charge like time and a half or something like that. And you need to have all those things in your contract and motionhatch.com has a lot of freelance resources and they actually have some free contract bundles on there that you can get. And those can kind of help protect you. The other thing is you need to determine when you're determining your pay and stuff, you need to determine when you're going to get paid especially if you're freelancing full-time because if you're going to you could do your four days of work in january and they may not want to pay you until june and that happens a lot and you need to account for that that like you may be battling to get paid so if you have it in contract that they're supposed to pay you net 60 meaning that within 60 days of delivering the final product they need to give you your paycheck and you have that in a contract, it makes it a bit easier to kind of push for it. Now, like some clients are just going to bully you. And the, I mean, if they're inclined to pay when they want to, they will do that no matter what. And, you know, you may not have enough money or make enough money off the project to really legally enforce that, but it certainly helps to have that there in writing at the beginning of the agreement. And then the other things you need to account for when you're determining your hourly and your day rates, you need to account for uh, taxes. So, you know, depending on what country you live in, what state you live in, that can be radically different. Here in Kentucky, I have to account for the fact that if I charge a thousand dollars, the government's going to take a, and the government and our local county and the state um, are all going to take about forty percent of that paycheck. So, a thousand dollars is really only six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to account for that. And then in terms of like average rates, I can only speak for the United States and mostly in the Midwest area, but usually the average like going day rate for like a junior would be around four to 500. And for like a senior specialist, you're looking at around seven to 800 for a junior hourly rate. You're looking for 50. If you're just beginning, you're like intern level, you're more likely to get like 25, 30. But if you're like a junior and you know what you're doing, around 50. And if you're a senior or a specialist, you can probably get around 100. Um, and those numbers sound kind of high and they sound kind of high to ask for, but um, you'll, you'll be surprised that if you start asking your clients for more money, you are going to get turned away. And I have been turned away. And it's easier for me to get turned away because I have a studio job to fall back on that I'm not going to go bankrupt. You do need to price yourself higher as Ben just saying to get people to kind of value your work and value your time. And you need to value your own work and your own time. So I know that's kind of a long spiel, but that's kind of like the, the basics of freelance pricing, kind of the averages and kind of the general safe approach. Obviously there's a lot more minutia and like details mixed in there, but I'd say that's kind of the broad overview. Uh, one awesome. thing I got from that, I wanted to ask, so how do you deal with people who try not to pay mm -hmm. or you know if it's in the contract that says you know you 
net 30, net 60. And they're like, they're trying to pay much farther. How do you go about dealing with something like that? More specifically, people who just try not to pay you at all. So have an attorney. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, for me, I've only ever had one client that was really rough on the pay. Um, I just, I just kept calling them like over and over and over and eventually they paid me and I got lucky. Now I know people that have not been paid and Ben just right. Yeah. It's attorney up and having those contracts up front will make it easier. But the problem is if you do a project for a thousand dollars, like taking them to court and fighting for a thousand, it's like, you're going to end up spending more money on, on that. And it's like, unfortunately you're just out and some people do that. And that's just Mm -hmm. a rough part of freelance that you have to be prepared for. For me personally, I like to form relationships with the people I work with. So I don't work with many random clients. I mostly work with studios and agencies that I have friends in or that I've met with in person and had coffee with. And I go talk to these people. I go buy these people lunch. I talk to these people so that I've kind of formed a relationship. And I think once you've formed a relationship and you've kind of taken the, you've taken the internet face off of it, it's easier to, I feel like you're less, you're less likely to run into that scenario. I feel like that scenario comes up with random clients. I've never had it come up with a friendly client. If I can also interject, um, one thing that can confirm that the client is probably going to pay is if you do 50% upfront, if it is like a flat rate. If you're doing a flat rate, which is the only thing I've ever done um, just based on the kind of work I do, if they pay you that 50% upfront and if they do it pretty quickly, then they're probably going to pay you that next 50 when you're finished. They're more yeah. li- more than likely to do that. So if you are working a flat rate, um, and they do give you that 50, which I would say never start a project without getting some kind of payment beforehand. Um, I don't know how it works with hourly, but with flat rate, because you know it is you're going to get paid at the end, you need something, you need some money while you're working um, to pay things. So if they do pay you that 50 up front, they're likely going to be trustworthy people and they're going to pay you that right afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Either get the 50% up front, which is very legitimate almost every single deal i do has 50 percent up front or what you can do is if you're delivering a video a product whatever you send them a low res version you don't give them the full thing you show that you've done the work then they pay half or pay full and then you give them the full quality thing there, yeah. there's a bunch of ways to ensure in a negotiation stance point of thing it doesn't matter if you just assume you trust nobody there, there are ways to ensure you get paid. So having yeah. 50% up front, only sending them part of the product, That's those are ways to do that. If it's a, Yeah, that way you do it, you would do a third, a third, and a third, and that would work too. Yeah, if it's a random client too, you um, uh, you can watermark it. I've done that before when I'm working with random cl- Like when I work with clients that like I've already worked with, I'm like, they're going to pay me. They pay me mm-hmm. three times, you know? But like if it's a new random client, I'll usually watermark it because it's like, uh, you can send them a low res version, but like watermarking it really ruins it. <laughs> so it's like yeah. they really can't use it if your names are crossed it and faded out text. Um, yeah, but uh, I think it's also uh, that's a really good point. And also, there's uh, if you if you're looking to study freelance and you're doing so, we're kind of speaking from a motion design perspective. That's kind of where most of us come from. You know, like three D animation, two D animation, um, things like that. Uh, Joey from School of Motion writes a book called The Freelance Manifesto, and he goes through everything. He goes through how to budget yourself, how to determine your rates, how to like do your accounting, how to pay your taxes, how to find clients, how to cold email clients. It's an amazing book with a lot of great tips, and it's specifically geared towards our like demographic, right? Like it's specifically for people doing what we do. So it's very helpful. So I wanted to shift gears from from money into the actual work. Um, someone asked, "How do you grow a good portfolio when I haven't gotten any good jobs?" What's oh, what's y'all's opinion on? I that? know how to answer that. Great one. Question. What I've been talking a lot. <laughs> Benner should go first. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, when when you haven't gotten professional jobs, that, that it's kind of the catch twenty two, right? It's like yeah, it's kind of like you know, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Like you you, you need Eddie Van Halen, but you need a triumphant video and you can't have like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say just get the best stuff you possibly can. And then don't be afraid to ask people for advice. And and we've gone over this before in, in a previous episode. Um, but you want to get people that, that you trust 
you know, that, that'll give you the, you know, not, not your mom or your, your, your dad or your brother or your cousin or your uncle to give you advice on your reel, but people in the industry, you know, and be nice, ask them and, and, you know, post on Reddit. And a lot of people on Reddit seem to be, especially in like the VFX subreddit, they seem to be, you know, veterans. They're and, brutal. Um, they can be brutal, but, but that's good. You want brutal because you're going up against people that uh, you're, you're, you're going up against, you know, insane competition out there, especially for the studio jobs. And uh, you, you want to just put your stuff out there and don't be afraid. And they're going to rip you apart. And that's just part of it. You're going to get ripped apart working a day job anyway. So might as well, you know, get used to it, grow a thicker skin and, and take their advice. You know, and, and you, you'll learn, too, as you're going on. You'll learn what good advice is and what bad advice is. And you'll learn, like, you know, the, the right kind of criticism and the wrong kind of criticism. And just take the good criticism and build on it. And just, just polish it until it's the best you can you can possibly be. And know that that's still going to be not the best ever because you're always going to grow as an artist. What I would say, too, is that, like, even if you work at a studio, even if you work with great clients, you still might not get great work for your reel. And... That's just yeah. like a fact because a lot of the paying work and most of the work, I mean, like that cool work you see out there is like 1% of the work like produced. Right. And even then a lot of studios that take those jobs, like if you look at buck TV, which is a really amazing top of the line animation studio, they only show about 5% of their work on their website. I was listening to a podcast with one of their uh, workers. They only put about 5% of their work on there and behind the scenes, they're doing a lot of work that's not pretty, that pays the bills. And even on those jobs that they are showing on there, they're not always breaking even. Sometimes it's a sacrifice. Like sometimes it's a personal project and they just, they do a bunch of work and then they'll just be like, okay, we're not gonna make money this month because we're gonna make this project to promote ourselves. Or they'll like break even on a project. So a lot of times like the good paying work may not be what you want on your reel and that's okay. And most of my reel is my personal work. And I think sometimes people think that's bad, but that's like totally fine. People love seeing personal work and they love seeing that mm -hmm. you take the initiative to explore and to learn. And uh, a lot of times people will hire you for your personal work. And what I did when I was creating my first website and really switching from like 2D After Effects animation to more like 3D animation. What I did is I scheduled meetings with various people. So I found a creative director in town that worked at a studio that produced like uh, work for several large brands. And then I met with a producer in town that worked at a film studio. And what I did is I sat down with them and I watched my reel with them and I said, okay, tell me why you wouldn't hire me. And they pointed out everything they didn't like about my reel. And I said, okay, why would you hire me? And they most often pointed towards my personal work. And they said that I like this and this and this a lot. So you don't need clients to get clients. You can just, if you're, if you're, if you're good at what you do, just make stuff and put it on your reel. You know, don't be afraid uh, to put in that extra work and put it on there. And I think what you're saying is great advice too, that you should be reaching out to people in the industry for mm -hmm. critiques. So also, Dusty, you just made your reel. Did you get it reviewed before you, uh, or did you just have it put it up? It's out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ready to no. fire aim. <laughs> no, I feel very confident in my reel um, because it's the exact kind of work that I want to do. So I don't really, I've, I've been doing it for a little bit. And one, one thing I wanted to say is you have to do personal work. You're not just going to like learn After Effects and then get hired. Yeah. Yeah, that's not. not going to happen because you have to have work. So your first reel is going to be primarily personal work mm -hmm. because you ha don't have a bunch of clients and that's fine. There's nothing to be like scared of people. People are going to go, Oh, he hasn't worked with anybody. We don't know if he's going to be reliable. Um, that's when you, you know, that's when you go to someone, you have a conversation with them and you, and if your work is really good, really clean, top notch, not a lot of people are really going to care that you haven't worked with people before, nor are they, going to ask that question. Most of them are just going to see it. They want you to do stuff for them and then you do it. And then as you keep doing that, you learn about freelance, you learn about, you know, working in studios, whatever, and you get that experience, but there's no way you're just going to start getting clients from knowing a program. Yeah. Because what's your style? What are you doing? What, 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 um, your portfolio, your entire portfolio can be personal work, especially if you go into college then your portfolio is going to be college work as well, which is fine. Yeah. The, you do not have to have clients to have a good reel. A reel is just your work all compiled together to show you as a product. 
you know, this is this. All right, good. No, no, you go. I just got done talking. I, I was just going to say that this is the exact same problem a lot of people have when they go into computer science. They learn how to program. They effectively know this thing. But, of course, they haven't gotten any work yet, and they need to show that they know how to code. So what, they, what do they do? On their resume, they put a bunch of personal projects. It's very similar. If you don't have work, just make something that you can present. That's the point. You want to show skill. Yeah. 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 So two things on the notes you talked about not being able to find work with like clients and how that's not an issue to like illustrate how little of an issue that is at uh, the studio I'm at, they, they're hiring a bunch of people. Like when I got there, I was like the sixth or seventh hire and they had already, they had just hired a person before me and then they've already hired three or four more people and they're hiring three more people. Um, so the studio is like growing really quickly. So I've kind of been there with everybody and I've even been in some of the interviews and in some of the process, like scanning the resumes with people. And I remember once one of the people who was in charge of hiring that particular person went to their website and they just had like a bunch of logos of clients they went for. And he literally said, uh, whatever. And just like scroll down, like, I don't care about these. Where's their work? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, cool. Like you worked with big clients, but did you make good work for them? You know, and it's like a lot of the people we're looking at, it's like we're looking specifically at their work. And a lot of the work we're looking at is personal work. And that's fine. That hasn't been a deterrent. I will say that is for more like junior, like that would be like junior animator or animator. If they're looking at like an art director or like a manager or something like that, like a higher up role, having clients and things in there, they're going to want to know that so that you know how to like handle big accounts and things like that. But like, if you're just starting, you're not expecting to land those jobs anyways, and that's fine. So if, if you're entering in at that level, I think it's completely normal to be mostly personal work. And I think that's fine. Uh, I said, I, I've been, likewise, I've been in, in, in positions where we're interviewing and I've been in interviews and I've, re I've, I've reviewed reels before. And uh, a lot of times for us, uh, we're not, we're not in like the, the sexy stuff. We're more like, industrial manufacturing type um you know engineering we just we want people who who can fit with the team and who can sit down and just you know start producing from 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 the get-go and, and we realize like a lot of people you know younger people are not going to have that volume of work but if you can show that you can sit and you can do the work you know and and you're you're cool being at the place that we work it, it's you know it's it's 90 percent of the battle right there so yeah. I, you know, we've, we've hired people that, that didn't have a lot of experience in, in doing what we do, but we knew they could sit and do the work and we're like, all right, cool. You know, the software, you know what you're doing, you've proven it. And, and most of it was personal work. We're like, all right, you know, when I got hired, um, to, to the current job, it was mostly personal work. I don't even think I had, like, I still can't have 95%, 98% of the stuff that I've done commercially because it's, it's proprietary stuff i can't have that on my reel so it has to be a lot of personal stuff it's also important so, to put the kind of work on there you want to get hired for so mm -hmm. like what a lot of people do is it's like i want to work at disney and then they like submit this reel with like a bunch of like after effects work and it's kind of like that's not what disney wants to see disney wants to see maya character animation so like if you want to work at disney make that work i wanted to do more character motion design so i completely rebranded my reel to take out a bunch of design products that I was actually really proud of and had like a lot of fun working on, but I didn't want that kind of work anymore. And I just ripped it out and replaced it with what I wanted. Um, yeah. A client's not going to, you may have the skills to produce the work they want, but they're not going to hire you on your word, put the kind of work on your reel that you want to get hired for. And I've even seen that like with all of our applications where it's like, we're trying to hire a 2d after effects animator and we're getting all these reels with like disney style like maya animation and it's like they're really great but like that's not what we're hiring for you know it's like wow you're really good at what you do but we're looking for 2d after effects work do you have any of that to show us you know they're like well yeah we'll use after effects it's like well can we see it and it's like they don't have anything to show so it's like you need to if you're if you're targeting certain types of clients or certain types of work, you need to produce that kind of work for your reel, even if it is personal, to prove that you can do it on a client. Exactly. Like I uh, just really quickly interviewed. Uh, I, I we talked about this yesterday a little bit in the uh, in the bonus podcast that uh, I had interviewed with Blizzard before the the World of Warcraft team, and they were super cool guys. I mean, it was just 
best interview, I, I, probably the coolest interview I've ever had. And I just didn't happen to have any game stuff that was in their style on my reel at the time. And they were like, well, we, we can't, you know, your stuff's awesome. You go out and, you know, work in commercials and stuff. Your stuff is phenomenal. We'd hire you, but we, we would need to see some game stuff. And I was like, I, it, totally, it totally hit me. Uh, I was like, wow, that was like a 10, 10 or so years ago, maybe 12 years ago. And uh, it, it just really hit me. I was like, wow, you got to really tailor your work to the place that you yeah. want like just, just don't just like fire out a bunch of reels without doing any research on the place you want to work or the type of work you want to do for freelance because it's it's not targeted at all you want to be as targeted as you possibly can yeah i actually made it to like a second round with like blizzard as well and then got cut awesome. off for, for a similar reason i was like i was trying to get in on their video editor position and they're like oh we'd like to mm -hmm. set up so and so and then it's like i got cut for basically the same reason i didn't have it was like i had all the skills but i didn't have the work for that particular studio. And it was just like, <laughs> you know, like it's yeah. very true. As you're, you know, learning from beginner, intermediate, professional, how do you know when you're ready to start working with people and start taking on assignments and jobs and things like that from like just bedroom hobbyist to, mm -hmm. you know, working with people? How do you, at what point do you feel like you're ready to actually do that? In, In our case, they going. contact you, right? And then you know yes. for sure. So that's how yes. we know. But as, as for like <laughs> reaching out, I, I don't know. You just got to try and they'll tell you if it's trash or they won't tell you if it's trash. They'll just say no. And then you have to assume um, there's no reason to not try to, you know, just reach out there. There's nothing bad that can come from it. It's hard to tell without some critique. So like we've been saying, drop some stuff on our slash VFX or our slash blunder and mm -hmm. get people who are better than you. Cause I think you could probably tell if somebody's better than you to give you a critique. Now, otherwise you just got to try and they'll tell you if it's good enough or not. <clears throat> yeah. It's also, you know, if you want to get hired for a particular style of artwork or animation or whatever, uh, if you feel comfortable that you are, you're good at it and say that they say, Hey, we want you to rig. We want you to make a character rig it and give a walk cycle animation. Well, if you don't know how to do that, then don't try to get those clients. So exactly. that's when you would that's when you know you're ready. If you feel comfortable, like you feel like you can take on tasks that people are probably gonna ask you to do. Even me today, like I, I'm um in my work, I still have a little anxiety every time a client comes to me that they're gonna ask me to do something that's out of my wheelhouse. Um, which is also very important to have a lot of work that you do so that they know what to ask you for. Because if you're just if you just say, "Hey, I'm a 3D artist," and they want you to do environments, but that's you've never you don't know how to do environments, you don't know how to make all these types of things, volumes and all that, then you're gonna have some problems. So it, also that's why you need to have a reel if you want to get hired, so that people can see the type of work that you do. Um, so that's when you know you feel ready. If you're if you feel comfortable in your work and your style, and you're ready to take on, it's all about how you feel about yourself. It's not like there's not some person that you go to and you show them your work and you're like, all right, you're ready to take on clients. And then you go and try to find clients. Yeah. It's all about how you feel. And if you feel confident in your work that you can tackle what people ask you to do, that's when you're ready to fly. I think getting a mentor is great too. And if you work at a job already, you might be able to get a mentor for free, but most likely you're going to have to pay if you want a real good mentor. And I actually just, I'm signed up now, like announcing it soon, but I'm actually going to become start working more with MoGraph Mentor. Um, and MoGraph Mentor actually does that. They do. They have a bunch of people. Uh, they have people from Disney and they have like uh, Disney's like illustrators and things like that, like their character design artists. And they, they have like the people doing like art direction for like uh, Microsoft and things like that. Like they're working with some pretty big people there. Uh, they have Handel Eugene, if you're familiar with him, he did the Spider-Man awesome. credits. He's really good. So they have all these amazing designers on their team and you can actually pay to like join their program and they will like mentor you and it's expensive if like it's it seems expensive up front because i think it's like two to six thousand dollars i'd have to double check the pricing it's expensive up front but you have to think about that's cheaper than college mm -hmm. and you're getting like inside industry knowledge and, and you have to think about it because like if you invest money into your career, you can help yourself make more money. You have to be wise about how you do it. But I know freelancers that produce average or like they produce like, okay work. Like it's not very pretty work, but they make over $200,000 a year because mm -hmm. they're good at business because they've met with people like that and they know it. 
I'm not that good at business. <laughs> you know, I, w- I wish I was. Um, I'm talking like Midwest. I know out in LA, you guys make like way more money because everything costs a fortune. But <laughs> it's ridiculous. It, yeah, but uh, yeah, you can get in there with mentors like that, and they can really guide you. And those online mentorship programs are are great because they will guide you artistically and business wise, and you know they can help introduce you to people, and it's really great. Um, that if you if you feel like you're serious about it and you're kind of moving along in your career but not knowing where you're going, it may be time to seek out a mentor and try and get guidance in that regard. So yeah, yeah I've had a couple people ask me to mentor them. Um, for anyone watching who might ask me, I'm not prepared to mentor anyone personally. I've only been doing this for about three years, so I think once I hit ten ten year, I can do that. I would love to mentor someone one day. Because I, I love teaching, so I do the YouTube channel stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love but if you're too. reaching out to me, I've had quite a few mentorship questions. I'm not ready for that, which is another thing. Like I know in a place where I could teach somebody. So that sort of goes into the question, like, do you feel like you're ready for freelance? It's also a good thing to be humble and know when you're not ready for something and have a realistic expectation of where you are mm-hmm. in your learning experience. And it's fine to not be ready for something. That just means you got to work harder. And when you feel fully comfortable, then go do it. But there's nothing wrong with it saying that you're not ready for something. That's, you know, you don't want to, that's, that's how you crash and burn and get very big failures. Yeah. It's, it's the jump in the fire mentality too. Like you, you, you can do it, but you, you also know that, you know, like I, I've, I've been saved and I've helped save other people by just having a network of cool people you know, in the industry or, or doing the same thing who you can call on if you get in a bind. I see some of these people like leaving comments on some of some of the channels on YouTube. And I'm like, you, you guys don't even realize like what, like some of these douchebag comments, you're kind of like, where I, do you have friends? Like, <laughs> do you realize like that if you're just cool to people, you're going to get so much more. You're going to be able to call on people if you get in a bind, like if you get a freelance job and something comes up and you can't solve it, like having a, a, a network of people you know that 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 you're friendly with that you could reach out to or the people are cool they'll help you and it it saves you in a lot of places and it, it actually helps you take on bigger projects because you know that if if you can't solve something yourself you know that there are other people out there that can help you and even you can kick them a few dollars and you know they'll help you out too and you can spread the work around so it, it having a network is really important that's for sure yeah and being nice within that network like you're saying being nice you know you um you can't even start doing any of that until you start making work Mm -hmm. which is you know you just have to have a good you need to develop a work ethic which is one of the questions how do you overcome laziness when you're trying to go after your goal um my answer would to that to be like if you're just starting out you're trying to learn after effects you're trying to learn blender try to be curious the only reason why i learned any of these creative programs because i saw cool stuff i knew what program they used it used to make it and so i learned it and that's just from pure curiosity. And then because of that, I learned that I love it. And even to this day, I'm I, I'm having so much fun learning these things because I love what I'm making. I want to make cool things. I want to be curious. So at least my answer to that would be if you're if you're feeling lazy, mm-hmm. that means you're not excited about what you're doing. Find something that you're very curious about, you know. Yeah, and also live by the 80-20 rule. So there's this book called Eat That Frog, and they talk about how oftentimes the most beneficial thing for you to do is just to like eat that frog, which means that basically just just swallow it and get it over with and then your life will be better because you're just done with it. So like a lot of times if you list out everything that you want to do or everything that you want to learn or everything you have to do to achieve your goal, you're not going to be able to get through the entire list. There's not enough time in the day. So you got to prioritize 20% of it, like the top 20% of it. So shift that list around, do the 20% that like will get you the furthest, even Mm -hmm. if it's not the funnest part of the list. And then if you have time, work on those other things. Most of the time, you're probably not going to have to. And it's really just a big priority game. Like I I know me and Blender Binge, we work full-time studio jobs and we come home and like we also work on freelance and we also work on the YouTube channel. And that's because I really like the community. I really like teaching and I really like making my own animations and then sharing with people how I make them. I I like giving back to the community. I like working with the community and I like getting to kind of produce my own artwork. So yeah, living by the 80, 20 rule and prioritizing really makes a big difference. I wanted to ask uh, CG matter. You're probably, if I could say it, 
the most active Blender tutorial guy on YouTube? I'll take it. I am the you most probably active are. tutorial guy. How um how do you find how do you, how do you find the motivation to churn out that much content? Hmm. Well, what I do, the, the the motivation part of it is I get creative burnouts. I just start throwing in random, just random stuff in there. Uh, the, I haven't the the newest one. I'm peeling a potato in a bathtub. It's just it's just whatever. But I don't know. I don't know where the motivation comes from. I think part of the whole like meme lord thing helps. I I just have a lot of fun with it. Um, if you're not having fun with it, you're you're probably not going to be motivated to do it. But I, I I like laugh as I edit sometimes and um. You, you got to enjoy it for one reason or another, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. that's like I do. Like We're all talking about like working long hours and I don't want to encourage long hours, though. I don't think long hours are healthy or should be the goal. Like work life balance should yeah. definitely be your goal. And um, I'm 29 and I'm putting in a lot of work now in hopes that when I start a family, I will have more time to spend with my kids. That's my goal. Um, so uh, I've pulled all nighters. I, I work right now. I work about 12 to 14 hours a lot of days of the week. And I've worked every weekend since Christmas. But it's kind of like I, I'm willing to put that time in now knowing that it's temporary. But like I wouldn't want to be doing the same thing my entire life. And I, I think that's important too that it's okay to work long hours at times. But that like shouldn't be your goal. And sometimes it may be necessary, unfortunately, just like with what we do. Sometimes. The way I see it is, uh, you, you know, when you are really into a video game and you just wouldn't go to sleep because you just keep playing it into the night. If you can, if you can somehow turn it into that, yeah, that's the that's actually goes into one of the questions. Someone just plainly asked, are you getting enough sleep? <laughs> yeah, no, I sleep about five and a half hours a night. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. I prioritize sleep a lot. So if I'm up past 12 o'clock. Then I sleep in, unless I have class in the morning. Then I'll yeah. sleep in at ten. I find sleep to be very important because if I'm sleepy during the day, I'm not. I, I hate. I hate being sleepy. That's my least favorite feeling. So for me, I pri prioritize that eight hour. Mm -hmm. So if I dig into work into the night, that means it's going to cut into the work the next day, which is fine. Sometimes I'll, I'll stay up till three working, which means tomorrow is going to be mostly a day off mm -hmm. for me. So I find because just it's very it's bad for your health to get a little bit of sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, but there are times where I'm not getting sleep for sure, yeah. but I feel great because I'm drinking way too much coffee. <laughs> yeah. Your mental health and yeah. your physical health play a big role in your energy. So, um, oh yeah. So that's quite a mug. Yeah. That's awesome. For, for the audio listeners, Clunderbench has a Darth Vader cup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have that same one. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, uh. Uh, your, your physical and mental health play a big role in that. So getting enough sleep, um, taking self-care off days, taking time to unwind, taking time to get outside, be physically active, making sure you're taking breaks to stand up, walk around and eat healthy. Like all those things play a big role because I've seen there. I've seen people when I was fresh out of college, I was basically working these hours like all the time right now it goes through seasons but i was working these hours all the time and now that they're getting closer to my age like pushing up to 30 they're starting to burn out already they're just they're losing their creativity and they're just like losing their motivation because they just they push too hard too long and didn't take care of the things that matter so that's important you got to avoid burnout too yeah a lot of the guys in entertainment burn out mm -hmm. uh you, you, if you go on any of the subreddits i mean I, and i've heard this live and i've talked to lots of people here uh, and I've largely stayed out of Hollywood. I, I live here, but I, I've largely stayed out of that, that, you know, I, I found a, a, a niche inside of, you know, inside of, uh, uh, of engineering and it's not the sexiest place, but the hours are pretty regular. Like, yeah, I, I work, I work a lot, but I also have off, you know, weekends and it's, it's rare that I have to work weekends and, and over time. And, uh, when I do, it's, you know, it's, it's usually I have some, some lead time on it. And I can plan for it, but yeah, it's uh, it's really important to strike that work-life balance. And if you can maintain that, then great. It's there's no, I, I, you know, a lot a lot of the younger guys, you know, they they brag about how much they work. Oh, I, you know, I work forty hours. I work eighty hours. I work seventy hours. I work one hundred and twenty hours this week. It's like there's no, you're not going to win anything other than deteriorating health. <laughs> like that, that's your that's your prize. Your your prize is like premature aging for doing that kind of work. Like. 
if you're working that much and you're getting a lot of money and you can bank it and you're investing it, great, awesome. If you're like, if you're getting all that money and you're blowing it on a, you know, five hundred dollar car lease, like, <laughs> just to show off, and I, I don't know, like, you, you're you're gonna pay for it, and it's gonna happen sooner than you think. You got to strike that work life balance. It, it is very, very important, and especially like as you get older and you have kids and family, and you want that and you want more stability. Man, <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, and also um, on that work life balance, starting this YouTube channel, um, I think it's important because we talk about the negative commenters a lot. They seem to get all the attention, but I get plenty of positive and encouraging comments. And then there's lots of people that support me by commenting on the video, liking the video, subscribing with a bell icon, all those things help oh, me yeah. in the algorithm, which helps everything perform better. And, mm -hmm. um, I've been getting a lot of love on Patreon and all these things. And, uh, thank you to the blender community for being so gracious. Cause I know that you guys have had success there as well. And that helps achieve a better work-life balance. And it makes, you know, I spend sometimes 10 to 20 hours on a single tutorial. You know, uh, that that's a lot of work, but when the uh, reception is so gracious and encouraging that, you know, it, it definitely helps with work-life balance. So I think it's definitely, and a, a, I think a lot of people listening to this podcast are probably, since it's relatively new, are probably people that were already followers of us and came over. So definitely appreciative of people like you that take the time to indulge in our content and support. You know, we enjoy giving knowledge back, but we also enjoy the kind of the praise and things yeah. they give back. Cause I know that's taking time out of their day or money out of their wallet. It, yeah, it is sure. a lot of my subscribers too are awesome people. You know, mm -hmm. I have a core group that is there all the time and, I, and I'm so, so, so happy that you guys are there and I'll like, I'll just keep teaching as long as you keep learning. Like, yeah. it's yeah. awesome. I think I speak for all of us on that one. I get this yeah. weird guy, CG Matter, that comments on all my videos, like just random things, though. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. Yeah. I get yeah. comments from him, too. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah there's another one, Default Cube. He's starting to. And he comments up. on the CG Matter <laughs> comments. He's like con responding to himself <laughs> or something. I think they're brothers. Yeah. I think, no, I, think like, I don't know who's like running Blunder Nest because I, I think we all have access, but somebody somebody's commenting from Blunder Nest account too. I don't know who that is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think this is a good spot to to end it off. This is a great one. Hope you guys learned some some stuff. I learned some stuff, and thanks for being here. Support us on Patreon, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Cool. Awesome. Bye bye.